<clears throat> thank you. First, I'd like uh, to thank uh, my old friend Ernst Steinkellner uh, for founding this fabulous program that remains a foundation for Buddhist studies uh, around the world. I'm very happy to see him here uh, this evening. Thank you also to Klaus Dieter and to the Zatra Foundation for organizing this great event and for uh, bringing us all together for the next few days. At the end of May, I traveled to Los Angeles where I had been asked to speak at the retirement ceremony of Gregory Chopin. In preparing my remarks, I had occasion to review much of Chopin's work. In one of his essays, I read that the redactors of the Mula Sarvastavati Vinaya, quote, did not have much good to say about monks who engaged in asceticism, meditation, and doctrinal learning. If they mention them at all, and they do so infrequently, it's almost always with a tone of marked ambivalence, if not actual ridicule. Ascetic monks, meditating monks, and learned monks appear in Arvinia, by and large, only as slightly ridiculous characters in unedifying, sardonic, and funny stories or as nasty customers that good monks do not want to spend much time around, end quote. In another article, he says that scholars and meditators, quote, almost always appear as the butt of jokes, objects of ridicule, and, uncom and not uncommonly, sexual deviance, end quote. It's only by implication that Chopin suggests that those characterizations might extend to those of us who study the works of these scholars. <clears throat> as we think about to talk of the Garba over the days ahead, it's important for us to recall several of the lessons of Chopin's oeuvre. First, that the majority of Buddhist monks in India had little knowledge and perhaps little interest in what we tend to think of as Buddhism. For example, he provides a passage, again from the Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya, that explains what to do when a monk does not know how to explain to the visiting lay people uh, what the Sibe Corlo, the Wheel of Existence painting is. This is something in America that we expect 18-year-old undergraduates to be able to uh, recite on their exams. Monks, it seemed, were far more interested in what Chopin calls business matters than they were with Buddhahood. He also shows, as others have confirmed, that what we call the Mahayana remained a minority movement throughout its long history in India. Thus, as we begin, it's important to remember that at least in India, and likely elsewhere in the Buddhist world, when we talk about Tathagata Garbha, said to abide in all sentient beings, we're in fact talking about the 1%. Having provided that disclaimer, we can now return to our love of Buddhist scholasticism, especially now that Chopin has retired. <laughs> in other words, we can finally get back to thinking about the ultimate reality, and we can do so with a clear conscience. Chopin obviously did not have much to say about the Tagata Garba, but others did, and it's fitting that we remember scholars of previous generations who make our work possible. Perhaps the most important figure, at least in the early period, was Yevgeny Yevgenovich Obermiller, who in 1931 published his translation of Bratnagotra Vibhaga in Acta Orientalia. Obermiller is important because he was the first European to both recognize the significance of the text and to translate it into a European language. However, he was also important because he did what very few scholars of Tibet did a century ago, but what we all do now. He consulted with Tibetan scholars, in this case traveling to Buryatia each summer from 1926 and 1931 to study at Atsagat Datsan. Unlike others who would consult the native scholars before, who would consult with native scholars before or after, Obermiller, uh, in his prefaces, would always thank them for their assistance, and he would name them by name. We must lament that this, that this remarkable scholar, who did so much for our field, died so young at the age of 34, and that he spent his last years in such excruciating pain. In his uh, introduction, Obermiller calls the Uttara Tantra the most interesting of the five books of Maitreya, writing that it, quote, is the exposition of the most developed monistic and pantheistic teachings of the later Buddhists and of the special theory of the essence of Buddhahood, the fundamental element of the absolute as existing in all, in all living beings. We will have occasion to consider his choice of terms like pantheism and monism, 
rarely heard these days in the context of Buddhism. When I was studying in India at Drebung Monastery many years ago, one of my teachers was a Buryat Geshe by the name of Ngawang Nima, at the time the abbot of Gomang. He used to tell me about his own studies at Atsagat Datsan as a young monk in the 1920s, remembering the time that Cherbatsky and Obermiller came to visit the monastery. He recalled the abbot explaining to them the meaning of Ngungyur and Gokyur by first holding up his index finger, Ngungyur, and putting it under the table, Gokyur. In a strange karmic twist, decades later, that same monk, Ngawang Nima, now a geshe, would be invited to Leiden by David Rueg for assistance with his translation of Putun's Deshin Sheikh Ben Ningbo, Selshin Jebegen. In studying Indian Buddhism and the importance of the Mahayana, we've learned not to be deceived by the vast corpus of sutras. We know from other examples around the world that the size of a religious sect's literature does not necessarily reflect the size of its following. And we know that throughout the Mahayana's history in India, many monks regarded its sutras as spurious. One of the clearest examples of this is found in the Shravaka chapter of Bhavaveka's Tarkajwala, where he dutifully provides a very long list of complaints about the Mahayana, among which we find the following, quote, the Shravakas say, to teach that the Tathagata is eternal contradicts the statement that everything is impermanent. To say that there is pervasion by the Tathagata Garbha and that there is an appropriate in consciousness does not avoid the conception of a self. To say that the Buddha has not, had, has not attained nirvana is to say that there is no peace. These three claims contradict three seals of the Dharma." End quote. After providing the Shravaka's complaints, Bhavaveka responds to each briefly. And so he writes, quote, to say that there is pervasion by the Tathagata Garbha means that the Tathagata's knowledge encompasses all objects of cognition, not that he is omnipresent like Vishnu. To say that sentient beings have Tathagata Garbha means that emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness are present in the continuum of all beings, but this Tathagata Garbha is not like an all-pervasive, eternal, inner soul." End quote. So we see that Bhavaveka, therefore, tries to make Tathagata Garbha entirely orthodox, even rather ordinary. Criticism of the Mahayana Sutras from, in, from India into the early days of Buddhist studies in Europe continued. Thus we find another Yevgeny, Eugen Bernouf, complaining in 1844 about what he calls the developed sutras, his word for vipulya, and he writes, everything that the imagination can conceive as immense in space and time is still too confining for the scene of the developed sutras. The actors there are these imaginary bodhisattvas with infinite virtues, with endless names that one cannot pronounce, with bizarre and almost ridiculous titles, where the oceans, the rivers, the waves, the rays, the suns are coupled with qualities of unmerited perfection in a manner most puerile and least instructive because it is without effort there. No one is left to convert, everyone believes, and each is quite sure to become a Buddha one day in a world of diamonds and lapis lazuli. The consequence of all this is that the more developed sutras, the more, the more that the more the, sorry, the consequence of all this is that the more the sutras are developed, the poorer they are in historical details, and the farther they penetrate into, the, in, farther they penetrate into metaphysical doctrine, the more they distance themselves from society and become estranged from what occurs there. We know all that already, but it really doesn't bother us in the ways that it would where it bothered Bernouf. Thus, for example, when we read in the 21st chapter of the Lotus Sutra that Shakyamuni and all the Buddhas in attendance extend their tongues all the way up to the heaven of Brahma, withdraw their tongues, cough, snap their fingers, and an earthquake occurs, we simply shrug. In another sutra, however, the Buddha withdraws into a pavilion to meditate. Immediately, the sky is filled with huge lotus flowers, each the size of the wheel of a cart. The lotuses have not blossomed, but visible inside each there sits a Buddha glowing with rays of light. The lotus is then open, revealing the Buddhas. Nothing special there. Similar things happen all the time in the Mahayana Sutras. But what happens next gives us pause 
and gives pause to even the most jaded of readers of the sutras. Because the petals of the lotus did not remain fresh and colorful, as the sutra says, quote, then by the supernatural power of the Buddha, all the petals of the lotuses, without exception, became dark, deep black, putrid and disgusting, and no longer pleasing, end quote. This, of course, is the opening scene from the Vittataka Dagarbha Sutra, a text that here in its Nidana and in its famous nine metaphors provides perhaps the most powerful imagery of purity and pollution in the Buddhist canon. As anthropologists have demonstrated, purity and pollution is a ubiquitous cat dyad in cultures across the world and across the millennia. The language of purity and pollution is, of course, central to Buddhist thought, but in a different way, perhaps, than that found in the Hindu Dharma Shastra. Bracketing the important meditations on the foul, in Buddhism, the language of purity and pollution seems to shift from the public world of the body to the private world of the mind. As we know, in the language of Buddhism, the mind is described as samklishta, often translated as polluted or defiled, contaminated by asrava, oozing, the various abhidharmas provide long lists of klesha, translated as defilement and affliction, categorized as primary or secondary, each like a sickness with its own pratipaksha, its own antidote. The Buddhist path is famously called Vusuddhimagga. Among ideologies of purity and pollution, the Buddhist case, however, is complicated by what we generally regard as the hallmark of Buddhist philosophy, that is, no self. If there is no self, what is, what is it that must be purified? And amid all the pollution, is there something that remains pristine? This question would inspire one of the most famous and one of the most controversial doctrines of the Mahayana, one known, one known by many names, including Tathagatagarbha, a term that we're still not quite sure how to translate. Still, as we begin our conference, we must ask, is there any term in the vast vocabulary of Buddhism that raises more issues, causes more problems than Tathagatagarbha? When we examine the development of Mahayana thought across the Buddhist world, a world that, as we know, was not limited to what the Victorians called the North, can it be said that Tathagatagarbha and its many related terms, uh, Sugatagarbha, Buddhadhatu, Amalavijnana, can we say that this is the most consequential doctrine in the architectonics of, of Buddhist tutoriology, more consequential even than Anatman, to which it is clearly a response? Such a question would be easier to answer if we knew more about the Indian scholars of the texts and of the world in which they lived. We may disagree with Bernouf about the literary quality of the Mahayana Sutras, but he's right when he says that they provide us little in the way of history. Perhaps one reason why, despite Chopin and others, Buddhist studies never fully made the historical turn of others of the humanities is that we have so little to go on in the case of India. We study a religion without knowing with certainty when the founder was born, when he died, or according to some, whether he existed at all. When we compare the remarkable culture of ancient India with those of Egypt, Persia, Greece, and Rome, we're struck by ab absences. Millennia before the birth of the Buddha, whenever that was, we find all manner of historical records, biographies, and even personalia in Egyptian hieroglyphics and Akkadian cuneiform. In the period that saw the rise of the Mahayana, whenever that was, we have a vast liter Latin literature that describes the social and political Roman world in minute detail. In India, however, apart from the important corpus of votive inscriptions, we're largely left with Tibetan hagiographies of our heroes, the same heroes depicted one-dimensionally in Tibetan tankas, all looking pretty much the same. It's such an absence that causes the mind to wander, that leads the imagination to what might have been, perhaps to what must have been, and so I'm going to ask you to indulge the following fable offered with apologies to Paramartha, who provides a rather different account. The time, sometime in the fourth century. The place, Purushapura, what is now Peshawar in Pakistan. The setting, 
the home of Prasanashila, mother of two half-brothers, Basubandhu and Asanga. The boys, now grown men and both monks, have come home to the Northwest to spend the rains retreat with their aged mother. Basubandhu, the younger of the two, has arrived first. When Asanga walked in, he said, I came here as fast as I could. I heard at Nalanda that mother was sick, but she seems fine. Basubandhu replied, yes, I know. I needed an excuse to get out of Magadha, so I said I had to come home and take care of mother. Asanga said, you mean I came all, here, all the way here for nothing? Basubandhu apologized, I'm sorry. I just finished a book in which I criticized the Vaibhashikas and a monk named Sangabhadra challenged me to a debate. I needed an excuse to avoid debating with him, so I told the abbot that my mother was sick. Asanga said, tell me about the book. Basubandha replied, it's really very clever, even I say so myself. What I did was to prevent the Vaibhashika position in the shlokas, and then I critiqued them in the basha. It's in eight chapters and it covers all the major topics. Asanga said, I'd love to read it. Vasubandha replied, I'd like you to. However, it's not quite finished. On the way here, I decided I have to add one more chapter. At almost every monastery I stopped at from Magadha to Gandhara, I came across the, these monks who call themselves Vatiputriya. There's some kind of samatiya, but as far as I'm concerned, we might as well just call them Pudgalabad. They have this ridiculous doctrine that although there is no self, there's some kind of person that is neither the same as or different from the aggregates. They call this self avacha, by which they mean inexpressible, but to me it means unspeakable. Basically, they're just a bunch of kirtikas in monks' robes, and they're everywhere. So I decided I had to add a ninth chapter in my book in order to refute them. I'm almost finished. What about you, older brother? I haven't seen you in, a long, in so long, maybe 12 years. What have you been up to? Asanga said, you're not going to believe this. About 12 years ago, I decided I had, to, I had learned everything there was to learn in the monastery. But I still had some questions, so I thought I would try to contact Maitreya. I found a nice cave, and meditated there for three years. However, nothing happened. I decided to give up. As I was packing up my things, a man walked by, rubbing an iron rod with a silk cloth. When I asked him what he was doing, he said he was a tailor and he was making a sewing needle. The Sangha then goes on to tell the whole famous story, ending with the dog and the appearance of Maitreya, ending by saying, so I grabbed the hem of his robe and we flew up to Tushita, where he gave me five books that I brought back to Jambudwipa. Can you believe it? No, I can't, said Vasubandhu. <laughs> it's a wonderful story, but I'm your brother. Tell me what really happened. Asanga said, well, it really did take 12 years, but I wrote the five books myself. <laughs> I look forward to reading them, said Vasubandhu, and we have the whole rains retreat to spend together talking. Where should I begin? Asanga replied, I suppose my favorite is one I'm calling the Ratna Gotra Vibhaga. It's, also, it's about Tathagatagarbha. Vasubandhu said, I've heard that term, but I'm not really sure what it means. Could you explain it to me? Asanga said, well, it's complicated. How can I explain it quickly before mother brings in our, our lunch? You know the four Viparyasa, the four inverted views? Vasubandhu, of course I do. I'm not an idiot. Shall I recite them for you? To see what is impermanent as permanent, to see what is suffering as bliss, to see what is impure as pure, to see what is not self as self. These are the four things that bind beings in samsara. Well, said Asanga, the Tathagatagarbha has four qualities uh, called the gunaparamita. So what are they? Well, they're permanence, bliss, and purity. That's only three. What's the fourth? The fourth is self. Vasubandhu screamed. <laughs> Not you too, my own brother. A moment later, their mother came in carrying lunch, 
only to find her two sons wrestling on the floor. Vasubandhu had a sangha in a headlock and was punching him in the face. She shouted, are you boys fighting about Anat but again? <laughs> Vasubandhu, let go of your brother. You know perfectly well it's a violation of the Pratimoksha to punch a monk in the face. Give me your begging bowls and eat your lunch. But instead, of, but instead of giving him his begging bowl, giving his mother the begging bowl, a sangha broke it over Vasubandhu's head, knocking him unconscious. When he woke up, he had converted to the Mahayana. <laughs> and by the end of the rains retreat, he had written his commentary on the Sutra Lankara. Whether or not this really happened in India, our focus over the next few days will largely be Tibet. It's important to note that a similar conference could be devoted entirely to, to, to Takata Garba in China, entirely to, to Takata Garba in Japan, or entirely to, to Takata Garba in Korea. Indeed, it could be argued that Tathagata Garba, sometimes known by other names, provides the foundation and perhaps are problematic for East Asian Buddhism, from its epistemology, to its rhetoric, to its polemic, to its practice. In 1976, Robert Chimelo published an article in Philosophy East and West called Apophatic and Cataphatic Discourse in Mahayana, a Chinese View. I was a beginning graduate student back then. I still remember the stir that this article caused. In the, in the article, Jamelo borrowed two terms from Roman Catholic theology that described how knowledge of God is to be gained, the negative root called the apophatic or the positive root, the cataphatic. He saw two similar strands in Mahayana Buddhist philosophy with the apophatic represented by Nagarjuna and the cataphatic represented by Tathagatagarbha thought. Criticizing those in the West who proclaim Madhyamaka to be the pinnacle of Buddhist philosophy Jumello pointed out that in the vast tradition of Buddhism in China, the cataphatic had early on carried the day, outshining Madhyamaka. This begins in the fifth century with the first translation of the Nirvana Sutra, a text so important that it lends its name to what has been called the Nipanzong, or the Nirvana School Sutra, in, uh, sorry, Nirvana Sutra School in China. This is followed in the early 6th century by Bodorucci's translations of so many important works, including the Lankavadara, the Srimala Devi, the Angulimalia, the Mahabedi Haraka, and perhaps most important, not a sutra, but a shastra, his translation of the Dashabhumi Vyakyana of Vasubandhu, simply known as the Dilun in Chinese, so influential was this work that it serves as a foundation for the Dilun Zong, one of the early schools of Chinese Buddhism, responsible in many ways for the subsequent explosion of Tathagatagarbha thought in China. Indeed, so important was Tathagatagarbha that the Chinese rather quickly began composing their own sutras and shastras about it, the term in the guise, of course, as Indian, of, of Indian texts. The most important of these is the Dashang Chishinlun, known in English as the Awakening of Faith, a work whose influence is difficult to overstate. We should note as an aside that this famous uh, English title, Awakening of Faith, uh, goes back to the 18894 translation by Yang Wenwei and the Welsh uh, Baptist minister, minister Timothy Richard. Attributed to Ashvagosha, it was composed in China in the 6th century, probably by a follower of Bodhirucha and the northern branch of his uh, Dilun exegetical tradition. It would provide the epistemological template for Chinese Buddhism, <clears throat> complete with its own vocabulary. Here's a famous passage translated by Daniel Stevenson. That which we call Dharma is the very mind of living beings. This mind encompasses all mundane, and supermundane aspects of existence. As to the word meaning, there are three aspects. What are the three? The first is the idea that its substance or essence is great, insofar as the suchness of all phenomena is perfectly equal and does not increase or decrease. The second, the idea that its characteristics are great, insofar as the Tagadagarbha contains replete inestimable intrinsic merits Third, its function is great 
insofar as all bodhisattvas reach the stage of the Tathagata by resorting to this Dharma. He goes on, in order to explicate that the essential import of, of the Mahayana, we distinguish two aspects of the Dharma, of the one mind. What are the two? The first is the aspect of the mind as undifferentiated tatata. The second, the aspect of mind as the manifest arising and perishing of cyclic birth and death. Each of these two aspects encompasses the totality of all worldly and supermanian aspects of existence. How so? Because the two aspects are inseparable from one another. The true suchness of mind is itself the essential substance that is the singular, uniform attribute of all existence. It is, in effect, the essential nature of mind that neither arises nor perishes. All the myriad phenomena of manifest existence come to be differentiated solely on the basis of, a, of diluted thinking. Apart from discriminatory thinking, they have no mark of difference. Thus, all phenomena of manifest existence from the outset stand removed from verbal expression, removed from all signification, removed from all mental objectification. They are, they, they are thereby ultimately equal or uniform. The true suchness of ultimate reality is changeless, indestructible. It constitutes but one single mind. It is, in this sense, it's referred to as true suchness. Oh, okay. As for the mind and its aspect of manifest arising and perishing, the mind of manifest arising and perishing exists by dint of reliance on Tathagatagarbha. That is to say, the aspect of mind that does not arise or perish, and the aspect of mind that is subject to rising and perishing are, an integra are integrally conjoined, neither one and the same nor different from each other. This we call Alivignana. This consciousness has two aspects to it, which, which we put together enable it to encompass all phenomena and to produce all phenomena." End quote. The vocabulary is somewhat different from what we find in Tibet, but the topic is very familiar. The awakening of faith would quickly outshine Indian works and its influence in China. This apocryphal Shastra would be followed by apocryphal sutras, all concerned with the talk of the Garba, the Shurangama Sutra, so important it was eventually translated into Tibetan, the uh, Yandwe Jing, or Sutra on Perfect Enlightenment, and the Korean Apocryphon, the Vajra Samadhi Sutra. These texts would all deal with the question that would occur somewhere, sometimes manifest, sometimes hidden, in the subsequent contro controversies in Chinese Buddhism. What is the source of ignorance? And what is the relationship between ignorance and enlightenment? How does enlightenment function in the world? We find this question at the heart, for example, of the polemics between Huayan and Chentai. Chentai, by the way, would place Tathagatagarbha, a term that does not occur in the Lotus Sutra, in the category of the provisional. We find this question at the heart of the debate between Northern and Southern Chan, as prevented in the, presented in the Platform Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch. Also in Chan, we recall that the most famous koan in the history of Buddhism is, does a dog have the Buddha nature? To which Zhao Zhou famously answered no, but also answered yes. The question extends even to the Samye debate, where we note that the evil Hashang Mohyan was an adherent of the northern, putatively gradualist school. Indeed, we may regard Chan as one of several attempts across Asia to transform Tathagatagarbha into a practical contemplative technique. The, the Tathagatagarbha problematic in China extends even to the question of Buddhahood of the insentient, whether roof tiles possess the Buddha nature. It extends also to pure land, which we sometimes mistakenly caricature as philosophy free. During the Song Dynasty, Exodus debated whether Amitabha was the original nature of the mind and pure land was mind only, whether rebirth in the pure land was a mental fiction or a physical fact. In Japan, the operative, operative term is hongaku, the ch Japanese pronunciation of the Chinese term benyue, original enlightenment, a term that actually appears in the awakening of faith. I will say no more about Japan than that one sentence. Uh, because seated in the audience uh, is the person who wrote the book. In fact, the 566-page uh, award-winning book, Original Enlightenment and the Transformation of Medieval Japanese Buddhism, referring to uh, Jackie Stone, who's very kindly agreed to join us Samba eaters here for a few days. 
So thank you, Jackie, uh, for enlightening us uh, on Friday, I believe. I'll add just one other small note uh, about Japan, and that is the controversy over in original enlightenment and Tathagata Garba has extended into the present day. I'm speaking, of course, of uh, Hihan Bukyo, or critical Buddhism, uh, the critical Buddhism of Hakamaya Matsumoto, which regards Tathagata Garba and related concepts, uh, which they together call Datuvada, as heretical deviations from the Buddhist teachings of, an, of Anatman, Pratitya Samutpada, deviations that have had a range of negative effects in the world, including Japanese militarism and the persecution of minorities. Hian Bukyo has rightly been criticized on historical grounds. Still, it points to yet another perennial problem raised by Tathagata Garba. If, in order to achieve enlightenment, one need only to allow one's innate enlightenment to appear, what is the meaning and what is the purpose of praxis? As we read in the famous passage in the Gundavyuha, quote, at the time of the initial arousal of the aspiration to enlightenment, bodhicitta perfect enlightenment is already achieved. To return to India for just one moment, let me insert a brief Chopin-esque thought. We continue to lament the lack of a social history of Buddhist India, a history that might help us better explain why certain doctrines appear when they do. Scholars have suggested that the interpolation of passages promoting vegetarianism into the Lankavatara was an attempt to attract the patronage of increasingly vegetarian gentry. We know that the doctrine of emptiness is portrayed as difficult to understand, causing in some cases the splitting of skulls and the vomiting of blood. Should we consider, therefore, to talk of the Garba as a remedy, offering assurance that enlightenment, if not already present, is imminent, its presence ensured not through philosophy or even meditation, but through faith? In closing, let me turn briefly to Tibet. Since so many of the papers at the conference will be about Tibet, there's, not, there's no need to say much. The rich tradition of Tathagata Garba and the Land of Snows is very well represented on our program. Just as Tathagata Garba literature, uh, just as Tathagata Garba remains a topic of controversy in Japan, in Tibet, the battle flags of Rangdong and Shandong continue to wave. To illustrate this point, I would simply note that, as far as I can discern, the Rangdong position is not represented in any of the papers that would be presented over the next few days. <laughs> and so I would be remiss if I did not mention a figure whose name does not appear in the many abstracts of our conference, one whose name should probably be mentioned for a number of reasons, including the fact that 2019 marks the 600th anniversary of his death. I'm speaking, of course, can I say the name, Tsongkhapa. <laughs> we know from the study of Buddhism and of other religions that the designation founder is almost always awarded posthumously. A forthcoming biography will provide us with an entirely different figure of this heretofore two-dimensional yellow hat. Far from being the sectarian institution builder that he's often portrayed to be, he spent much of his life as an itinerant yogin, moving from one retreat center to the next with a small group of monks, and by four zo. A zo is a cross between a yak and a cow. He had always four zo with him, loaded down not with supplies, but with volumes of the dengue. A yogin who was guided throughout his life by visions of Manjushri, visions initially mediated by a yak herder, Lama Umapa. During Tsongkhapa's funeral, Ceremonies at Ganden in December 1419, the monks all chanted what was then and has remained the most beloved of his texts, not among the laity, but among the geishas, his Chongwa Tang Nyebe Ten Nambar Jebe Denje Lekche Ningbo. They recited Lekche Ningbo at Tsongkhapa's funeral. This text was written, of course, to counter Jonang Shirup Gyaltsen's Shandong view a view that had earlier been criticized by Tsongkhapa's Shagyaba teacher, Rendawa Shunilotra. Tsongkhapa died before the partisanship that was later fled Tibet, lied before, I'm sorry, Tsongkhapa died before the, partis before the partisanship that was later fled Tibet, particularly 
the partisanship that was carried out in his own name. This has been on my mind as I just corrected the page proofs of a translation of the famous Trumta of Zhang Garube Dorje, the preceptor of the Qianlong Emperor, the Trumta Lembe Zekian. Among Zhang Ya's many accomplishments was his translation from, uh, from the Chinese and the Tibetan of the aforementioned Shurangama Sutra. Zhang Ga's Trumta is fascinating for many reasons. Uh, begun when he was just 19 and living at the Qing court, it appears that it was intended as simply a work on Yogacara, on Semzamba. When he showed it to his teacher, his teacher told him to go ahead and finish it, by which he meant write the chapters on the non-Buddhists and the three Buddhist schools, in addition to make a complete Trumpta. Unlike the Trumpta of his student Tugen, Zhang Ya had relatively little to say about Tibetan schools. He focused almost exclusively on India. In his chapter on Madhyamaka, however, he pauses in a Shajung, ancillary section, uh, to discuss uh, the Indian schools and their affiliation in Tibet. That is, going through the most famous figures in Tibetan Buddhism from Guru Rinpoche himself into the 15th century and deciding who was a Chidmatra and who was Madhyamaka. Here's what he says about Jonang. He says this, not me, I just want to make that clear. The originator of the view known as Jomo Nangba is renowned to be the great adept Yumo, who was born in the vicinity of Kailash, who had a little samadhi in Abhinya, and he wrote some textbooks on Kala Chakra. The disseminator of the system was the omniscient Tlobaba Shirap Gyatsin. Later there arose many who held the view, such as Jonang Gunga Chochok. With regard to the system's view, they assert that the ultimate truth is positive, permanent, and independent, and they assert that an element which is the Sukhata Garbha that is permanent, stable, eternal, and adorned with the 32 marks naturally exists in all sentient beings. This assertion stands outside the system of all Madhyamaka and Chittimatra charioteers and is refuted with hundreds of scriptures of reasoning by the preeminent scholars of the snowy land, such as Rinchen Tok of Yardok, the foremost Rendawa, and the foremost great being, doesn't have to say his name, and his heirs. Jayapse. Zhang Ya continues, generally speaking, although the Tibetan translators met with impeccable Indian scholars, it does not appear certain that they sought to discover those scholars' assertions on the view. Even when they sought to discover their positions, these scholars and adepts taught an essential point concerning view or meditation that was appropriate for the mind of the questioner. It's doubtful that they explained everything they knew to that person. This is the procedure of the good spiritual guides of the Mahayana. They are not like the Tibetan lecturers of today, who when offered a piece of spoiled dried meat, will bore you with everything that they know. Therefore, with the exception of the Jonang system, and later the system of the translator, Daksang Shirapunchen, the instructions on the view of the majority of the early scholars and adepts had some Indian scholar or adept as their source. However, among their followers, some had little experience, but did not know reasoning. Others had studied a little, but could not distinguish tenant systems. A few wanted to repeat what had been said before, but they did not know how to even how to repeat the words. The majority mixed all the teachings they saw into those of their own system. It would be difficult to express all the ways that they've made mistakes." End quote. We'll have occasion to call Zhang Jia's claim into question over the next few days. To ask, for example, is he correct when he says that there are no Indian masters who describe Tathagata Garba in the terms that he enumerates? This, of course, is simply a Tibetan instantiation of the much larger questions that rebound throughout Buddhism. Questions of delusion and enlightenment, questions of self and no self. Indeed, as we begin our conference, we should feel a sense of gratitude at the opportunity we will have over the next few days to consider a topic that is of such great doctrinal and historical importance across the Buddhist world, a topic that at the same time raises psychological, philosophical, even existential questions of such perennial power. And now, having bored you with everything that I know, I'd be grateful for her piece of spoiled dry meat. Thank you. <laughs>